Good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of the Milford Informer. I am your host, Tim Coet. Tonight we have information regarding two of the most pivotal decisions Milford residents have to make in the coming weeks. To show you exactly what we have coming up on the show, let's jump right in with tonight's top stories rundown. Tonight, hear the final arguments made both for and against the proposed ban on retail marijuana establishments in the town of Milford as residents prepare to head to the polls this coming Tuesday. Also tonight, we have a recap of the latest important information relayed to Milford citizens regarding the proposed town acquisition of the Milford Water Company. And later in sports, we will take you back through the last week in Milford High Athletics with updates on girls volleyball as well as girls and boys soccer. Should Milford allow the establishment of retail marijuana shops in town or should those retail shops be banned? That is the topic that has received enormous debate around town for the last several months. Finally, residents will have their chance to decide on the future of marijuana shops within their community in a special election that will take place this Tuesday, September 19th. Many of our member-produced shows have given you the chance to hear both sides weigh in on the topic. Tonight, we'll provide you one final chance to hear the arguments both for and against the establishment of retail marijuana shops in Milford. Here now with their arguments are Brian Cole from Milford Citizens for Fairness and Donna Nero from Milford Cares. Milford Cares came together as a group of citizens who had been researching and following the legalization and commercialization of recreational marijuana in other states. As we became more informed, we were compelled to come together as a more organized group and therefore we formed a ballot question committee. We are now a larger, very diverse group comprised of local officials, community leaders, subject matter experts, local clergy, and business owners in town. Our mission is to share credible, fact-based, research-driven data with as many residents as possible to inform Milford citizens about the impacts of recreational uh, marijuana industry. There's two things up for debate here. One is the question of should we regulate and control uh, adult use cannabis? But I mean equally important is the issue of, of transparency in government. You know, we at Milford Citizens for Fairness feel that the entire process behind uh, the referendum, behind the change in the wording, has lacked transparency and has been pushed along by a, a small group. You know, contrary to the will of the almost 7,000 people who came out uh, and voted for recreational marijuana last fall in the presidential election. So what we see is the impacts of allowing recreational pot shops in Milford is harm to he the health, safety, and integrity of the community. From a public health perspective, we would be normalizing the use of yet another drug substance in a community that is already ridden with an opioid crisis that we're trying to fight. Also, that normalization is going to lead to the false perception that it is going to, that marijuana is safe to use. And just because something is legalized doesn't imply that it's safe. It's phrased a lot as bringing recreational marijuana in, and that's a little misleading. You know, Gallup polls have shown 13% of Americans use recreational marijuana now. Marijuana is here. Marijuana is not coming. It's already here. We are already dealing with it as a community. If, regardless of what the outcome is on September 19th, recreational marijuana can be purchased by residents of Milford and enjoyed in Milford, the only thing we're doing with a yes vote is we're forfeiting any chance to have any say in how it's regulated, have any say in how it's marketed, ensure that quality standards are met, ensure that uh, you know, the marketing is, is away from minors, which we all agree is important, and uh, we're forfeiting any uh, possible benefits in terms of, of tax revenues and, and jobs. In communities that host pot shops, 
there is a significant increase in use among teens because it's more easily accessible, more available. So they are at a higher risk. And then when we talk about products such as edibles, and 50% of the products sold in Colorado, for example, are in the edible form. Those products contain very high levels of THC. 30, 30 to 40% THC can be found in those edible products that are marketed to look like everyday products we would see on our grocery store shelves. THC is a psychotropic agent in marijuana. And the edibles, as I said, come in many forms, such as candy, brownies, cookies, pizza, uh, soda. And so these products that look like our mainstream products can very easily get into the hands of unsuspecting children and adults for that matter. These products are also very easy to pass around on the school bus, in the cafeteria, at the playing field. And we don't want to encourage that. And as far as, as safety elements go, you know, I think for one thing, the, the laws that have come out of the State House since the, refer since the initial referendum back in uh, November have done a very good job of explicitly laying out uh, strict uh, limits on, on the amount of THC products can contain, on uh, strict limits on packaging, on making sure that edibles are, are separate. And, and easily identifiable as such. Uh, and I think by working with legal sellers, who of course are incentivized to follow those laws or they'll lose their licenses, we, uh, we have a better chance of ensuring the safety of our community. A vital concern is the safety of Milford residents. It is documented that there is a significant increase in motor vehicle accidents and actually in the cost of auto insurance in communities that host recreational marijuana pot shops. Currently, there aren't any reliable field sobriety tests. Therefore, it makes it very difficult to arrest and prosecute drivers who are operating under the influence of marijuana. Since 2011, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation reported that the, num the percentage of drug driving has increased 42 percent, while over the same time period, the um, number of alcohol-related incidents has increased only 26 percent. This availability of marijuana, or the increased availability of marijuana, would further exacerbate those figures. Just from existing medical marijuana uh, establishments, again, testing facilities, uh, cultivators, things like that, we asked, right now, those companies employ about 60 people, maybe 70 people in Milford. We estimate, as they expand into adult use, that will increase to close to 300. Now, on top of that, there are, there's property taxes and business taxes and so forth, but there's also the community use agreements that they have to sign. They, we estimate that those agreements, just from the businesses that are already here, leaving aside shops still, will bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for the town of Milford. Recreational marijuana continues to be an illicit drug at the federal level. Therefore, there was no oversight by the FDA, and we don't have any regulatory body that controls recreational marijuana at the federal level. We also don't have the protection of the FDIC for monetary transactions. It is very difficult for establishments to secure bank loans or lines of credit. Therefore, this leads to the prevalence of cash transactions. As a result of these cash transactions, there's a significant increase in robberies both in the form of cash and in the form of product. The discussion has been a lot about cannabis and, you know, is cannabis a gateway drug and, and what are the benefits of retail cannabis and so forth, but this is not just about that. If you are ambivalent or you're unsure about cannabis, there are still good reasons to vote no. 
Voting no allows the businesses who are already here to continue to operate, to expand, and to continue bringing in jobs and revenue to the community. Uh, we feel that, that the ballot process has, has lacked transparency, as I said at the top. We feel that the community has already spoken out for this uh, last November, and we want to ensure that uh, the people's rights are respected and uh, taken into account. My husband and I are lifelong Milford residents, and we have both been active in our community. We've raised our four children here, and we would like to see Milford to continue to attract people who want to participate in all of the wonderful things that Milford has to offer, such as the Claflin Hill Symphony Orchestra, our Upper Charles Trail, the Milford Regional Medical Center, um, our fireworks at the 4th of July, um, Woodland School, we're so, we're so fortunate to have the largest elementary school in the state. So these are the things that we want people to come to Milford for. We, we don't want to have, we don't want to be known as that destination pot shop. We thank both organizations for sharing their opinions. Ultimately, the decision falls on you, the residents of Milford. On your screen right now is a sample version of the ballot you will see when you travel to the polls on Thursday. The ballot question reads, Shall the town of Milford adopt amendments to the zoning bylaw as set forth below which amendments would prohibit the operation of all types of recreational marijuana establishments as defined in Mass General Law, including marijuana cultivation, marijuana testing facilities, marijuana product manufacturing, marijuana retailers, or other types of licensed marijuana-related business within the town of Milford. Below the ballot question, you will find the text of the zoning bylaw. This section simply shows the bylaw that would be brought forth should residents vote yes to ban retail marijuana shops. It shows that under this bylaw, zero marijuana establishments would be allowed in any district within the town of Milford. Below the text of the zoning bylaw is a summary of the Mass General Law. Within that summary, it stresses that an affirmative vote would not prohibit medical marijuana establishments. Finally, at the bottom of the ballot is where you cast your vote. A yes vote would ban the establishment of retail marijuana shops in the town of Milford. A no vote would allow for the retail shops to be established. So to put it as simply as possible, if you are opposed to marijuana shops, your vote would be yes, and if you are in favor of marijuana shops, your vote would be no. The Milford Special Town election is being held on Tuesday, September 19th. The polls open at 8 a.m. and will remain open until 8 p.m. If you live in Precincts 1 or 6, your polling location is the Senior Center. If you live in Precincts 2 or 3, your polling location is the Italian American Veterans Hall. And if you live in Precincts 4, 5, 7, or 8, your polling location is the Portuguese Club. Now to move on to our next top story, the other major decision facing Milford residents is whether or not the town should purchase the Milford Water Company. Some new details emerged in recent days involving a potential increase for ratepayers should the town move forward with the purchase. In order to provide residents with additional information regarding this potential rate increase and the other matters related to the water company acquisition, the town held an open forum this past week. Let's take a look at some of the information that was provided in that forum. It is time now for the Town of Milford to make a decision on the future of the Milford Water Company. While reviewing results point strongly in favor of the town purchase, the most compelling reason is for users to control decisions that impact quality of water that the families of Milford drink. Uh, right now, obviously, the Milford Water Company is a privately held company, and we as a government do not have any control over customer service or the quality of water. So those, there aren't any local bodies that you can hold accountable. I would tell you that I wasn't sold on this process throughout, it wasn't an effort by me, let me say it that way, or by the board members, to have a, an assumption built in and then prove that assumption correct. I was never sold until very recently that this was the right thing to do and why that le that's why that letter went to you with my signature. That meant a lot to me personally, that before I penned that letter and before I signed that letter, that it had my full blessing. And, it, and I had done everything I could to understand 
what the process was. But I would tell you the greatest risk we uncovered, in my opinion, was the risk that the Milford Water Company were, were to continue to own that operation and run it. And I think what you'll see is evidence tonight about capital and investments that, that uh, explain some of, the th some of the challenges the Milford Water Company has been doing. I believe it's no secret that everyone has read the newspaper and we realize that there uh, is a necessity for a rate increase and I'm hoping to accomplish tonight to uh, make sure everyone understands how we got to this conclusion. There's definitely a short-term need to increase water supply and there's definitely a short-term need to uh, increase water quality. And through this process, we feel we've identified a lot of the issues that could potentially be done. We've translate, translated that to appropriate um, monetary value, and we've provided it into this model. And we've come up with a range of potentially 15 to 30 percent. A number of recommendations were also derived from the work that the Lincoln Group had done. One of which would be not to do any of that additional borrowing that was proposed in the first scenario, Schedule A. That was for a number of reasons. One, it's just, as I mentioned, it's not a good idea to take on that much debt. Two, it may not even be possible given the various um, coverage ratios that we'd have to accomplish. At that last forum, I mentioned that we would have to go through various checks and balances, one of which is Moody's analyst. We don't think we'd pass the test and further, even if we could, it's just not a good idea to take on that much debt. So this plan over 10 years would not assume any additional debt. It would all be pay as you go in the operational budget, or it would be a result of appropriating additional funds out of retained earnings. Either way, the revenue models seem efficient, given 15 to 30 percent increase to be able to cover not only operational expenditure salaries, but this modified, very strong capital plan that should accomplish both water supply and water quality. If we move forward, we would absolutely need to take that plan and really dig significantly deeper and develop a 10-year plan. That would be something the water commissioners would be involved with. That would be something that we would take and uh, make sure that year one, year two, year three has uh, a appropriate strategy as far as uh, appropriation. And we would, make sure, we would have to make sure we have pro the proper financial oversight and governance of this new enterprise fund. One of the goals we talked about from the get-go was making sure that all money remains in the enterprise fund. This model still accomplishes this. However, we want to, um, you, you heard earlier the selectmen talking about the warrant coming up, one of which will be an article that is going to need an appropriation or basically an immediate infusion for working capital from um, something like stabilization, I would propose, into the enterprise fund to get it kicked off. Over the next couple months, it's going to be very, very intense with negotiating the, the purchase and sales agreement in which a lot of items such as work and capital and startup costs and all that really, really needs to get uh, brought to center stage and put together properly. So if moving forward, that's really the next project and the next set that we're going to be looking at. Zach, you've mentioned four additional amounts of money that will be needed that are not in the $63 million or the capital improvements. Could you specifically tell me the amount needed from the stabilization fund to seed money, the funds to finish up the process, whatever that means? Excuse me, there were three. Seed money would be stabilization, $500 to $750,000 repayable back to the general fund and the co completed um, due diligence to complete the transaction, uh, legal fees, financial fees, et cetera, doesn't necessarily have to be from stabilization and more than likely would not be from stabilization, more likely be free cash. Got it. Is there any money going to be taken from stabilization, I guess, is the remainder of the issue? I thought I made that clear that, yes, it would be for the seed money of between five hundred and seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars Round figure, a million dollars. Thank you. If somebody could explain why option four is being recommended for a 30% increase over surrounding towns. 
you're referring to uh, the last page, which is giving multiple forecasts, uh, which is why we also presented at between 15 and 30 percent. Uh, this is something that once the commissioners are in place would help us um, determine what the actual uh, percentage would be. But as far as presenting tonight, we wanted to kind of go with that worst case scenario and show you that 30 would be the highest that we would be looking to do. And further, you can see from the very bottom line that it accomplishes every possible capital expenditure that we had presented in that medium case. 2009, we trusted you to fix this thing. It wasn't fixed. You allowed a water company to continue unchecked. And now here we are today trying to buy them. I still don't know what I'm getting in the end. Number two, talking about some other company buying them, I don't know. Would they be better? Would they be less expensive to us overall? Will we have to pick up 63 million plus another $10 million, $10 million in debt for that other company? I don't think so. So I don't know the answer to your question, Mike, about should we allow another company to buy it? But I still, I, I still don't think we're there, and I still think we're going to ask town committee members to vote when they don't have all the information. I don't think there's enough there. I just think there's a lot of yeses here, but there's not enough here to really sell me ongoing yes if I were voting on it. For some reason, people are of the opinion, and I appreciate your point of view, we're, we're the Board of Selectmen, right? We're in charge of everything. We're not in charge of the private Milford Water Company. We hold no authority over the private Milford Water Company. We can't hold them accountable. So uh, while I appreciate that citizens here are representing that they would like me to do that, there was nothing, there's nothing more that I would like in some cases, to have that authority. But we don't have it. It's the DEP who uh, manages the Department of Environmental Protection that manages water companies, their quality of water, and the uh, quantity of water that they can pump. So this Board of Selectmen, if you're holding us accountable for, for the quality of the water company, what happened in 09, and where we are since 09, I, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but you know, we're not able to do that. It is the DEP. We contact the DEP frequently. We tell them about the issues. It was just the last meeting that we had last Wednesday where we asked the town administrator to contact the DEP and let them know about our problems and also better understand what they were doing about this brown water. But that's the extent of control and authority the Board of Selectmen have. It's unacceptable to live in a town like Milford that's financially as strong as it is. We have finance committee members here. We have the chairman of the finance committee here tonight. They do a phenomenal job. And we live in this community, and we can't supply you water. If you remember last year, Selectman Buckman made a comment. I thought it was really great, to be honest with you. Not that I was concerned. I was upset I couldn't water my lawn, but his next door neighbor couldn't water his tomatoes. It's unacceptable. It's, it may seem funny, but it's unacceptable. Okay? If you're in business and you're supplying a product to a customer, you have a responsibility to make sure that you can supply that product. And if you can't, don't charge me for it. But yet you can't supply it and you want to charge me more? Unacceptable. So ladies and gentlemen, I stand here tonight. I'm the newest member on the Board of Selectmen. I can tell you that everything that I've seen, there is no doubt in my mind that we need to move forward, take this to town meeting, and we need to purchase the Milford Water Company. Our fall sports coverage has been in full swing over the past week. As we mentioned on last Friday's show, we kicked off our season coverage with the girls' volleyball team in their matchup against King Philip. We also had a chance to cover the girls' and boys' soccer teams in contests against Franklin and Taunton, respectively. Let's take a look now at how things went down in all three games as we present this look back at the week in Milford High Sports. We start with a premier matchup in girls' volleyball. The Lady Hawks, coming off of their appearance in the D2 Central semifinals last year, hoped to get their new season off to a strong start. The girls hosted Kelly Rex Division powerhouse King Philip. KP looked to be in full control early in this one. After a lengthy volley here off the Kelly Reichert serve, a clean setup on the left side for Sabrina Harstick would end up in the net to give the Warriors a commanding lead in the opening set. 
Milford would start to chip away with Juliana Tracy getting the stuff here to give Milford a key point. The Lady Hawks would make things very interesting in the set. Here Jill Valenzola comes up with the ace to make it 21 to 19, but King Philip would eventually hold on for the 25-20 opening set win. Milford would enjoy a very brief lead 7 to 6 early in the second set, but that lead did not last. King Philip would seize control and would take set two by a 25 to 11 margin. The Lady Warriors would refuse to take their foot off the gas pedal in the third set. The Warriors would rattle off 16 straight points to begin the third. They would finish off the set 25 to 17, earning the sweep over Milford and handing the Lady Hawks an opening day defeat. Milford TV was present for a pair of soccer contests this past week. On Monday, the girls were in action on their home field, taking on a very tough opponent in the Franklin Lady Panthers. It would not take long for us to see the first scoring chance of the day. Off the Franklin toss-in, Milford's defense was slow to react as Anna Balkas dribbled the ball inside the box, leaving it for a wide-open Jess Crouchel, who would boot it past the Milford keeper Olivia Marshall to give the visitors a 1-0 lead. The game would settle into an excellent defensive battle from there. The next good scoring opportunity would not come until the final four minutes of the match. Madeline Boyle would have the free kick deep on the attacking side. Her shot would kick off the crossbar and straight down but just outside of the goal line. Juliana France would rush in looking for the rebound chance but Franklin goalie Kat Robbins would make the save. France would collide with Robbins sending her into the net but the officials would say no goal was scored and ultimately the day would end in frustration for the Lady Hawks as they would lose by a slim margin of one to nothing. We'd see another low scoring affair on the boys side as the Scarlet Hawks tangled with the Taunton Tigers on Wednesday. Milford would have plenty of chances in the first half with not one, not two, but five corner kick chances. They would fail to convert on any of those opportunities, but finally late in the first Milford would send a free kick off the foot of Jordan Borges and junior Tiago Philadelphia would redirect it into the net off the header to break the deadlock and give the Hawks a one to nothing lead. The Hawks would play a solid defensive game, never allowing the Tigers to see extended time on their attacking side. In the end, the single goal proved to be enough to give the boys their first win of the year. The team improves to 1-2-0 on the season as they defeat Taunton by a final of 1-0. That is all we have for you this week. Once again, we remind you that the special town election is happening this Tuesday, September 19th. We encourage you to get out and vote. We will update you on the results of the special election on next week's show. We do hope you will join us then. In the meantime, from all of us here at Milford TV, this is Tim Coet saying have a great week. So long, everybody.